Um, so now I'm going to introduce the next session, which is one which is also very close to my heart because preservation is also a very important one, uh, which is about the future of open access funding. And I think once everybody is mic'd up, I'll also be at the back fielding your questions. So if you have questions, type them in the chat, online audience as well, please. But please try to also tell me whether you are in the room or whether you are online, because then I save a little bit of back and forth whilst the questions are being asked uh, to see, are you in the room? Can you ask the question di directly or not? So um, if you are all ready, then over to you. Thank you very much. Yep. You're on. I go on. OK. <laughs> so Ben, to take yours as well. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, the room is still full. That's good. Um, yeah, welcome to our discussion about uh, the future of open access funding. Um, we all know that everything is changing. A lot of, is changing every day in regards of mandates, uh, um, the needs of the academic community, in regards of open access. Um, and I'm very happy to have a very diverse group here. And I hope, actually I'm still missing one, <laughs> panelists, uh, and that's Matt. I am here, can you hear me? I can hear you. A little bit, but I can't see you. Ah, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> okay, um, now we have everyone together, and um, I'm very happy to really have a very diverse uh, uh, panel here to discuss all the challenge challenges we're facing. And uh, let's start from the right. Uh, we have oh my. Right, it's uh, Heather, and you saw her this morning already. Um, she will bring the vendor, consultant, overarching perspective about our industry really to to the panel. We have Hannah Hope from uh, Welcome, and uh, she brings the funder perspective. We have uh, Ben here with us uh, as researcher. Um, I think that's also a very, very often overheard voice in all of that discussion, I think. And we have Matt uh, with the library perspective uh, online with us. And uh, who we are missing here on the panel is really the publishing perspective. But uh, we have a lot of publishers in the room, and I assume we have a lot of publishers online, and I really hope that you take your chance to really ask that panel the questions you always wanted to ask. But uh, let's start. Let me get sorted here. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to start with you, Ben, really, uh, to give us your perspective yeah, as a researcher on where we are in this open access movements, open access publishing, uh, the changes of the last five to yeah, almost 10 years, I would say, how is that impacting your work as a researcher? And uh, yeah, where are you with that? Yes, thank you. Um, I, obviously my view is a, a, a subjective and partial one. Um, but I think if I was to summarize the sentiment in the researcher community, um, it, people are obviously much, people are obviously on the side of open access. It goes without saying. So in the battle, if you'll forgive the bad joke of Robert Merton versus Robert Maxwell, Robert Merton wins. Um, the monetization of our produce um, is at odds with science, and so there must be open access, and, and no one would argue with that. But I think it is fair to say that researchers are, um, have been, and probably still are, confused by the effective imposition of certain models with what might be perceived to be relatively limited consultation. And I think the knock-on uh, effect is that people worry about certain things, and probably there are three things they worry most of all about, 
um, sustainability, how that can be dealt with, not only financially, but how there's an imbalance in power in certain institutions in terms of being able to publish and afford to publish. I think they worry about aspects of the ethics associated with the very rapid change that is being in part imposed and how that will affect the community, um, the role of preprints, the role of what, what is a true version when we're thinking about preservation of um, scientific data in particular, um, the danger of pulling up the ladder on a generation of early career uh, group leaders who haven't published in certain journals and now have to weather the change and how that will impact their careers. And then more broadly, the ethics of science, um, people's response to peer review in an era of open access, people not knowing what a journal means anymore. A journal is more than just um, something that is produced, it's a community. You know, forgive me, but nature is more important than Springer in many respects. Um, and there are notions associated um, with uh, aspects of academic freedom. And without being too pompous, things like peer review are a societal cornerstone. It's how society deals with nuance, how it deals with fact. And open access is pushing at the edges of all of these things. So, it's a broad swathe of concerns, but I think those are all in the minds of researchers. Thank you. Hanna, as a funder, um, where are you standing? Uh, I mean, you're driving and leading some of the changes, uh, welcome being a signatory of uh, yeah, Plan S or part of Coalition S. Um, so, how, what is your perspective? Thanks. Um, so I First, I'd kind of like to qualify that the scholarly communication system that I'm talking about here is the predominantly English, North American, European journals, uh, many of which were historically subscription-based, and also the new open access ones. And in part, that's because where many of our researchers publish currently. Um, I think the financial viability of this publishing system kind of predates open access. There was questions around the serials crisis, the cost of these subscription deals. So I think we have, for a long time, had an unsustainable ecosystem. And I, I don't think e open access is the cause of that. But if we're not careful, it's not going to be the solution to that either. Um, and this, this probably leads me to ask more questions rather than answers to think about around the, the value of transitioning this system in full in its current format. And if there are questions around affordability in the current format, what can we change? What can we think differently around perhaps peer review or processes? And I think, Ben, you raised some great questions there about where we are, where there are issues and, and tensions within how publishing works and, and the changes that are being made. Um, and I think the other thing that I think about is how can we federate across different scholarly communication ecosystems to create something that is affordable and sustainable globally. Thank you. Matt, in the role of um, yeah, librarian or also yeah, like a bigger library consortia, so, uh, how did your role change and what are you trying to yeah, solve in all of that? Yeah, I think that we as, as uh, libraries and consortia have, have really tried to um, e evolve how we're working with publishers to be able to, um, I, well, I should say publishers and funders and all stakeholders in, in um, the, the scholarly publishing system um, to, uh, to, to really um, help drive the transition where we see our stakeholders within the university wanting it to go, right? So I, I feel like um, from that perspective, right, this, this um, open access transition is, is really in full swing in much of the world, but that's, it's in very different stages depending on where you are. So there are national consortia in Europe that have agreements that encompass open access publishing with almost every major publisher. 
Um, you have organizations and research communities in the U.S. where the bulk of research is available openly through a disciplinary repository. Um, you have other areas of the globe where um, uh, and entering into open access is still in very early stages, right? And I think one of the challenges that we're wrestling with right now is that every organization really sees themselves in this transition and in this open access future in a somewhat different light. Um, so we have kind of a, a preponderance of different models, many of which are tailored to the, the unique circumstances or, or drivers depending on their organization. Um, and I think that's what, what we're really trying to follow is what, our, what are our authors, um, other stakeholders within the university um, interested in, in us moving towards um, and developing models uh, to, to follow, right? So to bring it back to the idea of the future of open access funding, which is what we're focusing on in this panel, um, right? Many of these models engage in, in funding in a different way, leveraging library or institutional funds differently through flat fee models, article-based fees, crowdfunding, local infrastructure, um, relying on support from research funders in direct agreements with publishers or building global infrastructure to support repository-based open access, um, making commitments to, to funding with, with or without tangible outputs directly related to that funding, right? And so we're, we're really trying to figure out what are the models that can fit for the different circumstances for different organizations. Um, I, I think we'll probably get more into that as we go on. I can talk more about sort of how, how we're seeing ourselves at the University of California in, the, in this transition and what the models are that we're trying to adopt and working to assess as well. So. Thank you. Heather, so you have the overall view <laughs> on all of that right now. So what's your perspective? Yeah, it's, it's been a great learning experience preparing, you know, for the session and, and having, you know, so many unique stakeholders, as Sibylla mentioned. Um, I will say at Delta Think, one of the things we do is we track the trends around OA. Um, I work on the open access data and analytics tool, so I spend a lot of time um, thinking about this stuff. And, you know, to date, we've really focused on tracking the paid for OA, which, of course, doesn't give uh, as much visibility as we'd like to um, some of the publication models that are out of um, Latin America, some of the new emerging models. So that's something that we're um, in the process of um, incorporating um, right now. But um, you know, in taking the overall OA market, and we did um, our last um, you know examination of the kind of state of the the market uh, in October, and there's a lot of information online about that. Um, but we can see over the past couple of years that it's things have really accelerated um, and that uh, we do um, anticipate that when we take 2021 as a whole, which is the last complete year of data that we have at this point, the 2022 is still coming in, that the market was about 1.6 billion um, then, which is higher than uh, we had projected at the time. And that we think in 2024 it's going to pass the two billion mark, and I think it, it it will because we're usually conservative, you know, with our estimates. So with with current trends, um, you know, it's on track next year to pass two billion. Um, this is a big acceleration since 2020, and a lot of the publishers that we're in communication with, and a lot of folks here in the room did see, you know, the COVID bump or whatever you want to call it. Researchers uh, they weren't able to necessarily get into their labs, and so they pulled a lot of um, work that they had done uh, previously, um, and a lot of that uh, was published, published in a lot of open access um, formats, um, and. Uh, that, that trend you know, continued through 2021 and is now slowing in 2022. Um, and that increase is much larger than, of course, the increase in the underlying subscription content, which is usually in the low to mid you know, single digits when you look at the increase you know, year over year. Um, so where we sit as of the fall of uh, uh, 2022, when we looked at this, 45% um, of content was falling into that paid OA content with the, some of the caveats that have been mentioned um, uh, by the earlier speakers, but only 15% of the market value was coming um, from those publications. And so we need to think about uh, other um, uh, 
monetization uh, schemes that, that publishers have as we move beyond um, subscription content. Um, and also publishers are getting a little bit smarter at how they're allocating their revenue towards OA. I mean, a small example, but if you have ads that are running on your OA content, is that being allocated you know, to your OA value or is it being you know, allocated separately? So publishers are taking a second look um, you know, at some of those things. And you know, with the OSTP uh, memo dropping in August, of course, um, there's, there's a renewed interest on top of the Coalition S interest that already existed in the UKRI interest. Um, you know, and how are publishers going to make uh, this transition at a little bit of a quicker pace than they had uh, anticipated um, pre-August, which we can talk about um, in more detail a little bit later. Thank you. Um, going to my left now again, Ben, starting with you again, if, if you mentioned OSTP and, uh, um, yeah, and the OST most recent memo, which is slightly different from uh, the, the uh, Coalition S or Plan S approach. For you, how, how much as a researcher, how much is it impacting you, for example, if you work with, with uh, researchers in different institutions and with different funding or with different mandates? Uh, how is that affecting your work? So, and our circumstances are maybe slightly unusual. I, I work now primarily at a, a, a national institute, the, the Rosalind Franklin Institute, which is EPSRC, UKRI funded. And as a consequence of that, everything we do fundamentally comes under the banner of, the, of, of what UKRI set down in April of last year. And that means that no matter what we do, every single piece of work has to be published under that. Even if we just happen to be a collaborator on someone else's work, fundamentally someone else's work at another institution. So it has a, a, a very widespread effect, a very deep effect. I think more generally, the idea of how, it, of how to balance models, green versus gold versus what you might call platinum, um, is deeply confusing people. Um, and I think it relates slightly to this um, notion I talked about before of, of the power imbalance that could emerge based on the level of funding that certain institutions might have to be able to access those different models. Um, so, for example, at our um, institute, National Institute, our annual income, our annual budget for OA publishing is just over £10,000. So, you, some of you will know that's basically, in some cases, that's one paper. So then how do you balance the internal conversations? Do we think about philanthropy to pay for publishing and engaging with OA? And those are, in some cases, quite uncomfortable conversations because we want to make sure that people have access, especially our, our early career group leaders, our young researchers. So um, I think, I think the, the broad answer is it affects it at every level, um, but our response is not always the same. Okay, thank you. Um, there's actually a question in the room. Tasha has a question, so maybe you can come to the microphone. Should have sat nearer. Um, yes, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective about thinking about the topic of sustainability, whether there is something to be done about the perverse incentives that we have at the moment to publish more and more and more content while trying to restrain costs. Hannah, is that something you want to? Absolutely. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we, there's, there's a lot of work uh, going on um, around research incentives, research culture, um, the, the, to counter the kind of publish and perish narrative, um, and to look at how we can diversify um, research assessment and increase the infrastructure that exists around um, talking about the impact of other research output types. Um, I think this is, this is really key. Um, there's work gone on w within the UK um, around research culture, there's the Kuara, group uh, organization or collaboration, not quite sure what they are, coalition uh, within Europe. And, you know, I think hopefully there's other initiatives 
uh, in other parts of the world to, to shift that balance. Um, because I think you're, you're absolutely correct. Not everything needs to be published in an article. How we surface different research outputs, different database contributions, or the existence of data sets in different repositories, I think that's an important question for us to explore um, as a community. But you know, absolutely, I think you're right. Uh, Matt, uh, I involve you now in that as well because I think uh, looking at the different transformative deals you are managing uh, from a consortium or library perspective, uh, that's a challenge as well to really estimate publishing output and, and going further. So what is your uh, experience with that? Yeah, I would say from a a practical perspective with the agreements that we have in place, um, they're, they're not always purely based on, and I say not always, I should say they are almost always not purely based on um, just article output, right? We have some other uh, elements of cost control um, to, to help address this exact issue. Uh, right, because that's that's one of the challenges of moving towards a model where um, the the remuneration to to publishers is at an article level is that we're uh, moving into sort of an article economy where publishers are then incentivized to just publish more and more articles, um, and we have less control over that. And I think that's potentially where continued engagement from libraries and consortia in um, agreements that govern the, the financial interaction between consortia and publishers um, can help have some impact there um, because we can, we can disincentivize that um, by having caps on our spend um, under these agreements. Um, that's, that's one thing that we're definitely trying to do. Um, I think, uh, as, as Hannah was saying, right, a, a lot of this comes down to um, how we assess research, um, the, the promotion and tenure process, um, is notoriously opaque, um, but there are some efforts uh, within uh, the University of California to to push some discussions around how we um, uh, or how how our faculty implement that um, in a way that can uh, place less emphasis on volume of publication and more emphasis on quality of research and quality of those publications that are that are coming out. Thank you. Um, Heather, uh, if we look at the cost of publishing, um, so which alternative models to the traditional APC model do you think have the most potential to, to succeed? Is there anything out of the data you collected so far where you can say uh, uh, this might be a path uh, to recommend? Oh, I wish that I had the, 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 the magic uh, answer to that. Um, we do track, whenever we hear of a new model you know, coming out, um, we try to include information on that, um, both in the news and views that we publish and also in our, in our data tool. Um, I think it's, it's relatively early days for most new models. I think subscribe to open um, is a model that has been around uh, long enough now that there are some you know, analyses of it. It's been adopted by a number of different players. And so um, you know, when you do look at uh, data, um, you, know, you can get an idea of uh, whether uh, they're gaining traction in certain areas. But if you think about the number of publishers and the number of journals and articles that come under subscribed open, it's still, it's still very, very you know, tiny compared to everything else. Um, we're hearing more from publishers who want to do uh, some sort of platinum model because they recognize they don't want to replicate inequities in APCs, um, and so they, they're looking for that. Um, we hear more and more from uh, publishers who are thinking of setting up foundations um, so that they can uh, kind of break the direct connection between a sponsored journal. If there are a number of players donating to a foundation, that in turn supports a number of journals in a discipline, for example, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's a slight difference than if you know, those, those journals are sponsored um, directly. Um, 
I mean, Coalition S is now, as they're you know, winding down with the transformative journals, they're putting a lot more emphasis on transparency and APCs. So I mean, don't count APCs out yet. Um, it may well be that there can be a, a more equitable way of assigning APCs, that could be um, you know, contributions that go towards um, those APCs as well that are not um, just from the funders, uh, just from the authors uh, and their funding that are from also uh, philanthropic organizations or collective models. So I think um, we're in very much in an era of experimentation. Uh, and I always, I, I point this out you know, whenever I have a chance, a lot of the language that we use around models just didn't exist four or five years ago until Coalition S, uh, you know, focused our conversation. And so I have to think that um, there are really, really smart folks uh, in the room and beyond who are going to come up with new models and new language that we'll be here, you know, in a couple of years um, talking about. So uh, I, I'm really excited to see, you know, what happens next. Um, and you know, I believe that with a lot of uh, you know great folks um, working on that, we're going to see some incredible things. Thank you, Hannah. Is there something you want to add from from a funder perspective to that? So, uh, how open are you to experiment? Let's say that way. <laughs> um, yeah, I. I mean, one thing that we've been reflecting on is how we can um, diversify um, how we support. Uh, open access costs, you know, as a funder, the way we work currently with open access is, a, in, in effect, reimbursement of expenditure. Um, and so we're thinking about how can we um, extend that to better support uh, models where researchers may not have directly used a service, but opening up the potential for them to have access or for others to have access um, to that. Um, again, at the moment, that's restricted to institutions uh, where we fund uh, research to take place. Um, but I think more broadly, what I've been very impressed with is some of the uh, mixed model approaches that have been uh, happening um, with publishers. I know IWA, for example, has done quite a lot of work um, with information power to develop different types of agreements for different uh, consortia based on their preferences. You know, we still exist within a, you know, we have, as, as Matt said, you know, some people still want to finance read. They may want to finance read to support others to read, whereas other institutions and organizations are focused very much on a pay to publish service model. And so I think we, we are going to need to see that diversity to, to continue. Um, if we're looking for sustainability. Yes, I think uh, that's an experience all of us made, that there's not a one-fits-all approach uh, to all of that, and, uh, and that will carry on to exist after 2024 and longer, that uh, there are different perspectives on that. There's actually another question from the audience, so I invite Robert Harrington to the microphone. Um, hi, I'm Robert Harrington of the American Mathematical Society. Um, Mike, we've been talking about, or you have rather, been talking about um, mostly read access and the equity of read access. Um, I wonder if the panel has a view on the different potential inequities that may come for author choice of where to publish for those who may be receiving low levels of funding, maybe they are in smaller institutions and can't participate in some of the, the bigger transformational deals or may receive no funding. It certainly applies in my discipline. But we, certainly something in, in, uh, in the US, where I'm based, I know I sound like I'm from the US, um, you know, um, has come up with, in response to the OSTP mandate as a potential under, unintended consequence of author, author equity. Where, to, where may I publish my paper if I can't afford an APC, et cetera? So just wondered if the panel had a view on author, potential author inequities. Ben, can I pass that on to you? Because I think uh, you touched on that already with early career researchers as well, not being funded uh, well. So I think uh, you might have a view on that. 
You, you can. I, I mean, I, I think, I've, I, as I've sort of said already, um, I think it is an enormous problem and one that is building. I think it's not being analyzed, and I don't think um, the, the researcher community is really being consulted because there's a kind of sense of concern and people trying to deal with it as it's coming at them very quickly. I think there are various ways that it could be thought about, and, but I think the level of consultation with those who are worrying about it could be increased, uh, and that is the way to deal with it. I think there is a very strong problem, as I said, with this notion of, of pulling up the ladder. So, you know, the question I've been asked by a number of our early career group leaders, uh, you know, I have a joint position with Oxford as well, and it's a the question I've had many times is, they effectively are saying, it's fine for you guys, mainly guys, but you old folks, you've had your papers in Nature, Science and Cell. What are we going to do if we can't afford to publish there? Because science is international. These are our units of production. These are the things that we believe in. These are the things that motivate us. How will that be dealt with? And those are the questions they're asking fundamentally. I've, I've done this thing. I think it's remarkable. I want the world to know where should it be for history. And that's a very profound question. And so I think it, 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 they are deeply concerned that accessing that dissemination at the same level has not been thought about. Yes, uh, um, Matt, I think uh, within the deals you are closing, that was actually one aspect as well, equity. And uh, if you think about that multi-payer model or really keeping authors the option to pay or not to pay, um, is trying to yeah, more or less solve that slightly to uh, um, overcome that hurdle. What is your uh, view on that? Yeah, I would say um, you've really hit on exactly what my response was going to be to at least part of the question, right? Which is that um, within uh, the University of California where we have our agreements, we're, we're trying to address that idea of um, equity of access to open access publishing, which is sort of a, a mouthful of a concept to say, right? But um, we're trying to address that through a, a model where um, we're leveraging redirected subscription funding um, to support um, publication of every article to some extent. We're asking authors to contribute if they have grant funding available, but if they don't have research funding available to contribute, um, then we're covering the whole cost from that redirected subscription funding, right? And the, the, the big benefit we see from that um, is that we're doing our best to not leave behind those authors that um, are researchers in fields that don't have um, significant amounts of funding, right, like mathematics, um, or early career researchers that don't have access to um, those, those large research grants, um, uh, or, or anybody who's working on research that's not directly funded by, by a large funder for whatever reason, regardless of their field or their, their current status. Right, and I think that was a, a key tenet as we were developing this model um, was to make sure that we were supporting all of our authors and not just those authors that have to date already been able to publish open access in a lot of these venues, right? So uh, we've, we've heard from some of our authors that they are really pleased with that particular facet of the model, that, that they feel like they're able to publish open access um, in a way they weren't before. Um, I think to another piece of the question about smaller institutions in particular, um, we're, we're working to start addressing that um, by, by thinking about how we can widen our consortia um, that are negotiating these types of agreements. Um, I would say our, our agreement with the American Chemical Society is an example where we've sort of widened our partnership beyond just the University of California, which is 10 reasonably large research intensive institutions um, to also partner with um, a couple other um, uh, consortia or consortium like groups in the California State University system um, and Skelk. Um, and that brings in um, a lot of more reading intensive institutions that, that want to participate in the scholarly communications system, want to play a role in this transition. Um, but might not have the capacity to enter into these agreements if, if just left on their own, right? So I think 
working to widen these consortia to um, include those other types of institutions as a way to, to create those opportunities for authors um, at those, those smaller institutions that may not have that capacity otherwise. Yes, thank you. Did you want to add something? Yeah, so it, is, it is something that we've had quite a lot of thought, and I think um, so the research assessment and the work to reform that plays into this because it's ridiculous that this concept that you need a publication in one of three or ten journals to be a successful PI. I mean, it's, I don't even know why we keep saying it. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> but like the impact factor, it keeps on living. Um, I think there are aspects around policy design and how we um, can accommodate whether that's um, self-archiving or different versions of articles within policies to ensure that a version can be made open access, um, even if it's not the final version. I think there's also a question that we need to ask ourselves as a community is, is actually what is the right model? If, if someone wants a particular journal to exist in its current format, but the cost of that on a per article basis is astronomical, then is that the right model for it? And actually, is there a better way of delivering open access? For example, through Subscribe to Open. And I know Annual Reviews has done a lot of work around this um, because a per article APC wouldn't work for their journals. And you know, I, I think that other big publishers could do well to look at this model for some of their high cost um, titles um, to deliver that equity and, and to support the research community. Um, and perhaps even, you know, there's been work around, you know, you mentioned Heather, the transparency. Could you build in a model with capped profits or, you know, capped returns, which, which actually maintains a system if, if people want that way of publishing. Um, in, a, in a more equitable manner. If I, oh, sorry, Ben. I was just going to say that, you know, when we're talking about researchers, we're largely talking about Western European and North American researchers. And um, I ran a session for the Council Science Editor's virtual fall symposium where we looked at OA trends around the world, and we had um, a, a researcher and publisher uh, from Latin America, we had a librarian and publisher. Uh, from uh, Africa, we had two representatives on the panel from Asia. One uh, was a uh, Wiley, uh, uh, but based in China, and another was from World Scientific. Um, and we had, uh, you know, participation from uh, from some others who who worked through ASP and some some different initiatives. And it was interesting because the Latin American uh, speaker. They're on to like talking about you know how do you decolonize the, the syllabus and how do you bring more uh, feminist perspectives in. Th their conversations are at a level which we are just not even you know close to yet. Um, and then if you look at Africa, there's a there's a real pent up desire uh, to do more OA publishing, but there's not the local infrastructure there to support it yet. Um, and then. The awareness of OA in, you know, take Japan, for example, we did a project for a publisher that wanted to increase OA submissions from, from Japan, and there's just not a lot of awareness. Um, mostly you publish where your supervisor publishes, which is pretty much the way that it goes. And until we get supervisors in some areas of the world that have experience with OA, it's just going to not be on the radar screen of their students. And then, you know, what will China do? And the more recent emphasis to focus on um, homegrown OA journals in China. I mean, this is some serious uh, stuff that's happening, folks. And we're gonna, again, we're going to be here, you know, a couple of years from now talking about how that goes. So when we say researcher, there's just so many things that we can unpack about um, appetite for publishing, ability to publish, what's going to come next, what models are going to work. Um, you know, so yeah, I think we don't have nearly enough time to dig into all that today. Yes, Ben, you wanted to add something? It was just a brief comment, and I think it was prompted by a number of points that were made. I think there is a lot that could be done around what you might call the psychology and the ethics of publishing in the academic community. 
and why it is that people want their big paper and what's going on there. And I think it's, it's actually really very, at one level, very sound, very ethically sound. What they want is this thing to be tested to the fullest limit. And not all journals are equal. And some journals will make you jump higher, to put it crudely. And that is part of the process. And that, that, um, that comes from certain levels of peer review, certain levels of rigor. Um, not all papers are the same size in a very blunt analysis. And I think there is an argument for rethinking that. Publish less, publish better, if you'll forgive that very crude phrase. Um, I think it was Westheimer at Chicago, a chemist, who suggested that every academic should have 50 tokens. That's all you get in your career. Choose them wisely and publish them in lumps. That sort of thinking could go down very well in the community. People could understand what the model was, but the constantly changing models disconcert when people are planning things over decades. Yeah, I really like, I, I think that's a really interesting idea. We, we fund um, the open access publishing at, at different institutions and we see very different institutional behaviors around publishing and, and how they um, manage their publications, where they publish, um, how much they're willing to spend, when they publish work, when they, when they use other models. Um, and I think that there's definitely something in, in exploring that, that kind of really tackling that question on, on how and what you publish and why. We have another question uh, in the audience. Uh, Robin McRidge, I hope that's right. <laughs> you, you got it right. <laughs> no worries. So my, my question is around many institutions are that are in increasingly introducing quite strict APC caps. And I wonder what the panel thought about whether this would limit experimentation and innovation between funders, institutions, and publishers around new open access financial models. Matt, do you want to go for that? Um. I can start, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what the other panelists had to say as well, um, because to, to be honest, we haven't really uh, interacted with um, APC caps at all. Um, we have uh, a, a, a couple agreements where we have um, the ability to limit how much we commit um, at a per article level, but all of that still remains within sort of the overall financial construct of, of the agreement that's um, pretty well uh, controlled uh, financially on, on the, uh, the, the more macro scale, if you will. Um, so we, we haven't really had to go there yet. Um, depending on where those caps land, I guess that could potentially impact experimentation. Um, but I think that um, any sort of experimentation ought to be uh, at what is sort of agreed to be a, a reasonable cost, right? So I, I couldn't imagine really um, uh, impeding experimentation that would be sustainable in the long term by capping how much per article we're, we're able to, to commit to. Heather, is there any information you maybe have out of your data, what caps would have as an impact? Yeah, I think it's a really tough question because how you come to that cap depends a lot on the data that you have available. And I would say this is a data game, you know, on the publisher side and on the university side. And I see Matt and I have a lot of conversations about this, other people in the room, you know, so, each journal comes with its, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna say perceived impact, uh, which is tied to lots of uh, things about it, not just its impact factor, but um, its, its SNP, its source normalized impact per paper, lots of things like that. And so what the perceived impact is for a paper at a, may have nothing to do with what the publisher is charging for that APC. You, it, it's, all, it's all over the place. So I would, think that if you are a, a university and you're trying to come up with what's the right number, 
it's as likely to be all over the place, you know, as well. Um, but as more information comes out about APC transparency, I think there'll be opportunities for institutions to provide, you know, guidance and options to researchers where they can ask their librarian, you know, what it, I have an opportunity for a five thousand dollar APC. Is this a good use, you know, of of my money? And that different types of data tools. I'm going to say are ours, but not just ours. Can you can go in and say, well, here's another possible publication outlet that has a, a cheaper APC, but the perceived impact is is even higher. So researchers in that environment with the right information, the right data, and the right guidance would have um, the opportunity to make decisions um, and, and the publication pattern, I'll say one more thing and then I'll hand over because I could talk about this all day, is some of these models, uh, some of these agreements are token based and what is the cost of your token? Is that a good value? Well, where are your researchers publishing across that portfolio? It could be dozens or hundreds or thousands of journals. You better know which, pub which APC band your researchers are publishing in and how that's changing over time and if you're moving into new areas and if those are higher costs because that token may sound great um, but it's only going to matter if the majority of your researchers are publishing in a journal that has a, low, a higher cost that, that will give you a discount. And all of the ones that are lower than that, you're, you're, you're throwing your money away on that token. So that's all I'm gonna say on that. You can find me later in the bar. <laughs> Hannah, if I remember correctly, actually uh, a price cap was something in the original uh, release of uh, Plan S, wasn't it? And then it was, yeah taken out, is that something uh, which is still maybe under discussion or? Um, so I, I'm not 100% aware of the original version of Plan S because I was on mat leave then. But um, I, th you know, I think some, you know, as Heather said, like where you put that price cap, um, particularly in certain agreements, is going to be very different. Obviously, institutions are trying to meet various needs and cost constraints and and some institutions will will put price caps in at the point of affordability for them um, and I think you know that question of what is the affordable value of scholarly communication is one that we don't talk about enough we talk about impact we talk about our different models and how much they cost but I think we need to be quite frank you know if we want if, if certain journals want are wanted um, to be maintained you know what is the affordable value that the research community can pay towards those um, are those journals truly global journals are they just seeking to meet the needs of a subset of researchers within a certain population there'll be disciplinary norms around funding and what is affordable there um, so I, I can completely understand why institutions or, and some funders put in, put in caps. I don't think that that will risk uh, innovation. Um, we have seen new publishers form operating different systems at very different price points. It may even drive certain innovation and it may force the question, more publishers to ask the question of actually what are the system changes that we can make to, to deliver affordable value. You know, as we've seen with the APC model and $10,000 $10, APC, many people don't feed, feel that that's affordable value. Um, and so how, how can we change that, whether that is the model that we're using to fund it or the model that we're using to develop that publishing? Um, so I, I, I completely understand where these caps are coming from and I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if more institutions bring them on either formally or informally within their, their ways of working. So I get a five minutes warning here now, um, but uh, it would interest me as well uh, if there would be a cap on APC spend, how would effect would be the effect for you as a researcher? Would you recognize it or... Uh, fill it up uh, on, through other channels or what would be the effect for you? I think it's just another thing that would mess with people's minds. I, I think it just makes me feel even more strongly that 
money is a very crude tool for measuring the output of research. It's madness. And this session and the previous session, it's no place for the free market. The stuff that is being produced is way more important than money and trying to make a buck. And I think we've forgotten the roots of journals and you know, the transactions of the Royal Society, 1665, people getting together to peer review, to curate truth and put it out, not thinking about the money. And maybe we should go back to those roots. So, um, because I wanted to start the uh, yeah, <laughs> last round, what would be your wish? Is that really, if you look to the future, would that be the wish you would have in, in going back to the roots? I mean, I think you, we could learn lessons from societies of people who are, have a common goal. There is a danger that you'd simply create a closed club and that accessibility um, is vital, transparency is vital, but I think there is a system that's somewhere in between that can learn the lessons of people who are doing this effectively because it, it's their lives. You know, publication is a, a summary of what they've been doing for five or ten years, and that to them is probably the most important thing they may do in those five years. And if they can find the money to pay for it, they will pay. But to them, it's more than the money. It's vitally important. Getting back to that idea is where we need to go. And that can be done through societies, but it needs those core elements of things like quality, rigor, peer review to make it valuable in the broader sense, not in the monetary sense. Matt, if you would have one free wish for the future from a library perspective, what would it be? That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> I think that one of one of the big challenges, and I was kind of touching on this um, earlier too, is sort of the, the preponderance of, of models and different um, driving factors that that all different organizations in this ecosystem have, um, and I think all of this could be simplified if there was if, if if those driving factors could be harmonized a bit more right such that we we didn't need to have um a, all of these different pressures requiring different types of models for different publishers and different institutions um uh i, I think that could help this transition happen um in a more efficient way in a quicker way uh in a more uh, globally equitable way. Um, I think that's one piece of the equity question that, that we, we maybe skimmed over a little bit was, was global equity um, outside of um, just our own institutions um, and, and our own publishing communities. Um, so I think, I think some harmonization of, of some of those drivers I think would be my, my big wish. Thank you. Hannah, your wish. I think I would like to see more federation um, across the different uh, regional publishing ecosystems so that the Latin American systems sit equally with North American systems, which sit equally with African systems. I don't see the need for a single system to dominate global publishing. Um, and I, so my wish would be that we we, we adopt a more federated approach to s service provision around publishing. Thank you. Heather, you send us off with your wish. There's so many things. I would hope we could find a way not to increase the administrative burdens and requirements on the researchers who want to do the research. And even with the best of intentions, a lot of the things that get layered on the top, and we all know we want you know, machine readable, we want data sharing, we, we want so many things. They need to be able to do their research. So I would hope that we could come together in some sort of collaborative effort to see how this sustainable OA vision is possible without just layering so many additional requirements on the researchers that we just kill that spark that makes them want to do what they do. Thank you. 
Thanks everyone for that really interesting uh, yeah, viewpoints, uh, comments, experiences. Um, my wish to all of you is now have a lovely evening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, I think, a great day of, of discussions. And uh, I hand over the microphone to Mark to close the day, I guess. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>